Go ahead, Ken. Okay. Good morning, everyone. A special and warm welcome to our small group of East Coast Berkeley supporters. Thank you all for joining us. I've looked at the list of attendees and uh, it is an august group to say the least. Uh, I'm Ken Wong and I've been asked to convene the meeting, which means I have four minutes before I turn over to our distinguished moderator, Dean David Ackerley. And I've been asked to say a few words about myself and my relationship to Cal Berkeley. Here on the East Coast, as you all know, we call it Berkeley. Out in California, they call it Cal, so I call it Cal Berkeley when addressing a mixed audience. Um, I'm not traditionally a big joiner or a booster or clubby type of guy, but during the last few years, I've really been drawn back to the cause of helping Berkeley and to really wanting to help it stay strong. And it's for a couple of reasons, just briefly. First is personal. Uh, I was a New York kid that at the age of 18 felt drawn to the West Coast because I felt the East Coast was sort of traditional and non-diverse, kind of narrow-minded. And it was a fantastic life experience for me. And I, I, I'll always love Berkeley on, on an emotional level, not just intellectually. The second reason I've been so ignited during these last few years is because of leadership. You know, as we all know, leadership really matters. And I just cannot describe how powerful the shift has been. Chancellor Carol Christ is a dynamo. She is brave and courageous. She's not afraid of anything. And she's such a compassionate leader that she's almost uh, changed the narrative around the university. And I find it so attractive for any of us who have a loyalty or love of the university to try and help her and her incredible team who, who really have changed, I think, the trajectory of the university. I guess the last reason I'd like to mention is that whenever you get a chance to take a bath in, in the intellectual energy of Berkeley, it's just a treat. The incredible people, faculty and students, the work they do, the issues they take on, it's, it's, it's also something I think that gives us all such deep pride because Cal Berkeley is still first and foremost a public university and provides a first step for so many people. Uh, it is a university that says that uh, being a, a, a tool for social advantage, advancement is a good thing and it's part of our mission. So uh, that's why I love this place and why I'm so honored to be asked to open the meeting. Uh, let's move to our program. So it's entitled how Berkeley is using data science to tackle climate change. So if you break that into two parts, data science on one hand, climate change on the other, two huge forces and challenges. A, a, a panel on either one would be great. To get them together in the hands of, of Dean David is a real treat. So let me tell you a little bit about him. David Ackerley, wave your hand, David, if people don't know you, is the Dean of the Rouser College of Natural Resources. We used to call it CNR back in the 70s. Uh, his research focuses on climate change and the impacts on biodiversity and conservation biology. His research is used to inform strategies of biodiversity conservation in the face of climate change. And he has a particular focus, as many have read up on, he has a lot of different areas of interest, but a particular focus on California parks and open space. So he's, he's, he's doing, doing good while helping us at the university and bringing along all our students. The last thing I'm gonna say about David, having spent a little time with him in the past, doesn't show up in his official university resume, but he is an optimist. <laughs> so with all of these challenges, you get a sense of the possibilities for solutions to all of these problems. You get a sense of almost joy in understanding these problems. And he's assembled an incredible all-star panel that I'm looking forward to listening to. So David, thank you so much for offering and being the moderator of this. I'll let you take it from here and introduce our distinguished panelists. In a final word, thank you to our panelists. We know you are busier than we are and you're giving us a treat today during lunch hour on the East Coast. Thanks for getting up early. That's all from me. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. I know uh, some of you on the screen, but not all. And this is, of course, one of the pleasures. <clears throat> one of the pleasures of COVID is realizing how what, what, this is the right thing to do to drop in and have events like this. 
and not to orient everything around our long distance travel. Um, so it's nice to reach more of you. And we do thank you for taking your lunch hour. This is one of those days where this is my third call, one on the East Coast, one with Switzerland, and now New York. So this is, this is the world of COVID. <laughs> um, and uh, just to um, follow on Ken's remarks, the, the first is I cannot uh, emphasize enough how much his remarks about Chancellor Christ are shared on campus. Uh, people often hear me say that as a dean, if I come to work and can do half as good a job as she does as chancellor, then, then I'm doing my job. And, and it, 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 she just sets a bar for all of us to aspire to. And it has been extraordinary over the last few years. It's, it's inspirational. And especially in times of, uh, of such social, of social upheaval and challenge, that sense of optimism and possibility pervades Berkeley uh, in, in all times, even in difficult times. And certainly it's part of what's happening right now. Uh, we're incredibly proud of how we've come through COVID, but that's a story for another day. I also can't resist, my background is um, a picture from a couple of years ago from the Greek theater. For any of you who have the pleasure, I don't know how many of you might have graduated walking through the Greek. I was there yesterday. They're having campus leaders come and just hand scrolls to the students because they can sign up for a five minute a window, or no, it's like a 20 second window to to walk across the stage and just get, have a scroll handed to them and have their picture taken. So I just got that tiny taste of the exuberance, the excitement, the emotion. I mean, some students have tears coming down their faces at that moment of knowing that they have a Berkeley degree and they're walking across the stage. And, and what was kind of fun for me is normally I would do my own graduation, but here I got to hand a scroll to a master of city planning and uh, an engineer and an economist. So it's kind of fun actually to have students from all the different majors and just to see even more of that cross section of Berkeley and what makes it so extraordinary. So we are in the midst of graduation week and it's a great celebratory week. Um, so as Ken said, this topic is, is big, it's multifaceted. We have a lot going on at Berkeley. We're only gonna scratch the surface in many ways, um, but let me, let me speak to three, um, so sort of three stools of a tripod that frame our discussion today. One is of course the emergence of data sciences and we'll be leading off with that as really just a, a new incarnation of the intersection of computer science, of statistics and of how these come together to address the greatest challenges the world faces. And of course you all know this is transforming business, transforming academia and Berkeley is at the lead in that and we'll hear more about that. The second is climate change, and in the broadest uh, in the broadest discussions, we we frame climate change around three grand issues. One is, in fact, solving the climate crisis. This is often called mitigation, which is actually trying to reduce CO two emissions, the entire transformation of our energy grid, everything going along with that. We'll have that's a little bit less the focus today, but that's always present because the it is the only solution to climate change is to stop rapid climate change. Everything else is just trying to sort of offset some of these impacts, which we're also very engaged in. So the second broad area of climate change is understanding its impacts on the world. And what do we do about that? And one of the areas of great concern for us is in the area of biodiversity, and that we'll hear more about today. And the third pillar of, under, of tackling climate change is understanding the equity issues. And it's both equity locally and globally. Those who have done the least to contribute to climate change are suffering the worst impacts. And all solutions need to start from that, you know, that understanding. And the Biden administration is truly transforming the federal ag agenda right now to put equity front and center in, in the development of climate solutions. So those three pieces of the puzzle are always what we're holding. And of course, we can't go into depth in, in all of them. Now, as we proceed in the program today, you are welcome to drop questions in the chat anytime. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on it, but we'll come to them later in the program, but you don't have to hold them in your head and try to remember them. So you're welcome to just drop things in. And I, I will only um, apologize in advance because our experience is that most likely we're not able to get to all the questions, even in a small group. That's a good sign because it speaks to your curiosity and that we've engaged you and, 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 and piqued your interest. But if we don't get to all of them, um, and of course, you know where to reach us if you want to follow up. But again, you're welcome to use the chat at any time. Um, we have a wonderful panel. I'm thrilled to uh, be here with them. And they'll share more about their research and this intersection of data science and biodiversity and climate change. I will be introducing each one with a short uh, Q&A and then we'll go into some, some general questions for all of them and transition uh, about halfway through to Q&A from all of you. 
again, as you um, put questions into the chat. And, and if you, you know, I, I should add, well, we'll talk about it more when we get to the chat about how we do that. So our very first speaker is uh, Fernando Perez. He is an associate professor in statistics at UC Berkeley and a science at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Fernando builds open source tools for humans to use computers as companions in thinking and collaboration, mostly in the what we call the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, and he may want to share more about the nuts and bolts of that. His research interests include questions at the nexus of software and geoscience, seeking to build the computational and the data ecosystem to tackle problems like climate change with collaborative, open, reproducible, and extensible scientific practices. And all of those words speak to what this reinvention of data sciences is. And again, any, we can dig into any of these. He is a co-founder of the uh, 2i2c.org initiative, uh, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, the NUM Focus Foundation, and a recipient of the 2017 ACM Software System Award and the 2012 FSF Award for the Advancement of Free Software. So, Fernando, tell us about the emergence of data science and what is happening at Berkeley right now. Thanks, David. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually uh, and uh, and to be to be virtually in New York, which is uh, a place that I that I that I love. Um, we we have to do it this way, but I think it's an opportunity actually to reflect precisely on on the value of building tools that can connect us across the world. Because as David was saying, climate change um, is a problem that requires global global action. Um, and uh, and one of the things that motivates me to work at Berkeley is precisely that we are uh, a very good research institution, but we're committed to having real real impact in the world. Um, and that's a little bit what my path at Berkeley has been has been precisely. Um, for I, I was trained as a particle physicist originally. Uh, I did my PhD in Colorado in, in particle physics. And uh, over the years, I've been very invested in building open tools that anyone can use that can be shared freely across the world for scientific research. Um, and this is before data science was a, was a name. Uh, we were building tools for data science. And at Berkeley, what we're seeing is that the pervasive usage of statistical ideas and computational ideas has created something new, uh, something that is meaningfully different. Um, and I wanna specifically point out to the fact that the word, the term data science has a little bit of a dual connotation um, in industry, it tends to be the application of those techniques and ideas to solve business problems, and that's perfectly legitimate. Um, and whether it's optimizing your website or your supply delivery chain or the ads on your website, those are legitimate uses of these tools. But specifically in science, what we're asking is how can we combine these, this machinery to absorb and understand the wealth of data we have today to make scientific predictions, to understand the world itself better. And that's a nuance that is important. And that is part of the mission that we have at Berkeley is connecting, connecting with the traditions of science, our understanding of the world around us um, with these new tools. And what we're seeing at Berkeley um, is that the rise of these ideas is transforming the university. We have an educational program uh, let me briefly share here. We have a, a data science education program at Berkeley that is extremely broad reaching. Students, uh, undergraduates can take our courses from the very beginning and uh, they can connect with courses that take them after they take the foundations of data science. They can go to study economic models. They can go to study earth sciences. They can go to study politics. Uh, right, with these same ideas so that they get a grounding in the most modern tools of research and industry, which they can also apply at work, but they get connected to the intellectual body of the university. Um, and this is really transforming how the university proceeds. Uh, uh, quoting one of our postdocs who said recently, we are witnessing a monumental phase shift in data science knowledge on campus. The undergrads are extremely well-trained and sometimes they're even ahead of their professors. And it's wonderful to see that, that to see our undergrads actually get ahead of us because they are becoming so proficient with these tools. And Berkeley is a place that cares about both the core research and building this and sharing it with the world. So, Fernando, thank you so much. One of my at graduation, one of the pleasures was, you know, so and so BA in data science. So as they were coming across the stage, so handing those scrolls to some of our first couple, just first couple of cohorts of data science majors, a brand new major. So, Fernando, one one phrase we hear is machine learning, which 
um, often sounds like code for something mysterious and that the computers are doing that, is, that we don't, that, that none of us quite know what they're doing. Now, I think there are probably some people on this audience who probably know it very well, but can you give us your most concise description? What is machine learning and how does this relate to the problems that we're trying to tackle? For sure. It, it's not magic, right? They are black boxes and sometimes they feel a little bit magic, but it isn't magic. It, it's a highly refined set of mathematical modeling tools that in, in some ways have existed for a long time, but they've really come of age in, in the time of the computer because of the, the amount of data we have and the infrastructure to swallow that data, ingest it, and do something with it. But fundamentally, machine learning is about building computational tools that are very flexible and that when applied to a specific data set, they effectively sort of squeeze the, squeeze the essence, the mathematical essence out of that data set, and then use that output to do something new. And now it's important to appreciate the fact that you are squeezing whatever was in the data. The tools are generic, but you're squeezing something from the data. And that can be very valuable in the sense that you learn something that was hard to spot. It can also mean that you end up encoding the biases in, the, in those data. Right. And so machine and that is something that at Berkeley we pay a lot of attention to is not just doing technology for te technology's sake, but actually thinking critically, how do we build these tools and apply them in a way that is fair and that sometimes uh, avoids encoding something that was there because there were biases of our own society that had gotten us to that point. And what we want to do is something better, not simply replicate what was there, but they're fundamentally general tools that have become very efficient and their power lies in the generality, right? They were, they were not developed for climate change. They were not developed for earth science. They were developed as fundamental building blocks of computing and statistics. But that generality is a little bit like the computer. A computer is a blank slate in a sense, and you can be zooming or playing a video game or writing a paper. Machine learning tools are generic in that sense. And then precisely that generality makes them very important for problems like climate change that are not just one domain problem for to tackle climate change, oceanographers need to talk to biologists and they need to talk to environmental system scientists and they need to talk to social scientists and they need to talk to economists, right? And we need to be able to connect all of those things. And that generality of the machine learning layer will be critical if we understand it better, if we master it and we learn how to apply it in a principled way to scientific problems, which are not the same thing, as I said, as industrial problems. And then you're you're especially well known for your leadership in developing open open and reproducible tools, which is distinct from the nature of the tool itself, like machine learning. Can you give an example of what what does that mean as a researcher to be developing open tools, and how does it serve the community and in addressing like a, a geoscience problem like you're involved in or environmental challenges? For sure, yes. So for those of you in the audience who, who haven't heard of these things, um, a, a project that I started originally when I was in graduate school, it was called IPython and has grown into a lar very large community and the credit goes to everyone else, not to me, who does the work, is called Project Jupiter. We build open, freely available tools to basically analyze data, think about the data, do sophisticated computing in any programming language. Um, and these tools include something that you may have heard of uh, called the Jupyter Notebook, which is basically documents where you can combine a story with analysis and data. Um, they're freely available. They're widely used in, in industry. And uh, this is actually not an example from my work, but it is something that I really love to highlight because I think it, it goes to the, the points we're discussing here. This is a project in Canada called Callisto, which uses the Jupyter machinery to deploy computational infrastructure for education in K through 12, not in um, not at the high end of sort of supercomputing researchers, but in K through 12 context. And they also have a very strong mission of connecting with native communities. And so what they've done, they've built modules based on these Jupyter notebooks, based on these documents that can, can combine text and code and stories and data analysis. To, uh, to analyze um, issues that are relevant to indigenous communities in Canada. And a couple of examples they have that I love are the mathematics and the geometry of traditional uh, native First Nations basket weaving. There's a beautiful amount of group theory and mathematics and knowledge embedded in the traditions of these cultures. And they've built content partnering with those communities to, to, uh, to kind of study and analyze that. Um, and the second one is uh, studying the sustainability and the practices of their traditional fisheries practices. Um, and if you go to one of these things, you can click here. Anyone who has a Gmail account can then land on this uh, kind of um, screen, which is hosted by them, which is one of these notebooks about modeling 
fisheries developed in conjunction with the native uh, with the native communities to then execute the code and the analysis. And I could actually begin running this code right now. I'm running this. This is hosted. This is the free software that we've built. A lot of it at Berkeley, not only at Berkeley, but a lot of it at Berkeley, hosted by Canadian infrastructure to analyze the fisheries behavior of um, in this particular case, uh, in this region in Canada and uh, northwest of Vancouver, where this particular tribe uh, lives and fishes and whatnot. And so I think it's, a, it's an example of using tools that are generic to ask questions of global impact, but to put them in the specific cultural and geographic context that matters to a community. And that's one of the things that motivates me. Oh, Fernando, that's wonderful. I think uh, I'm sure a lot of people here have the experience of their kids coming home from college and being sure they know much more than their parents. Uh, with some of these examples, it's obviously the case that it's true. Our, our kids are going to be outstripping us quickly with these tools and skills and, and ways of thinking. That's just fantastic. Uh, wonderful example. Um, so thank you. And we'll come back with more Q&A. Our next speaker is Christine Wilkinson, who received her is receiving in the, this week her PhD from the Department of Environmental Sciences, Policy and Management. Christine is a conservation biologist who studies human wildlife conflict, carnivore movement ecology, and she uses multidisciplinary mapping and participatory methods for more effective and inclusive conservation outcomes. Before attending UC Berkeley, she spent several years working in conservation biology and natural resource management around the USA and in East Africa. She's also an informal educator, piloting and implementing programs for teens and young adults at the California Academy of Sciences and other locations around the world. Her experiences as a researcher and educator have developed in her a passion for conducting applied participatory research and for empowering community created solutions to pressing conservation challenges. And we've just learned in the, uh, as we were waiting just before you all joined, she's a native of Queens. So she's uh, back home with a New York audience. Uh, so Christine, tell us about your path to conservation and to UC Berkeley and how you've seen in your graduate research, the role that data sciences can play in conservation and in the work of uh, your, the other, your colleagues and peers in your community. Yeah, well, first, uh, can everyone hear me? Because I'm having tech issues this morning. All right, lots of nods, awesome. Um, I was one of those scroll recipients yesterday, David, but I think you had like relayed with, with someone else to be the, <laughs> um, so that, yeah, that was, that was really excellent. Um, so I guess I am officially a PhD recipient from Berkeley, which is pretty exciting. Um, so nice to be here with you all today. Um, as far as my path, so starting from the very beginning, yes, I'm from Queens. I grew up kind of running around chasing like squirrels and cockroaches and all sorts of other urban wildlife that I thought were very cool. And um, very much was kind of focused, really keenly focused on um, doing any sort of work with wildlife that I could uh, for my, for my path. I was very wildlife centered. I couldn't even imagine working with people at all. Um, very shy. And I had my eyes opened when I first studied in Kenya and Tanzania during my undergraduate, um, at Cornell, if anyone, you know, went to Cornell. Um, I went there and I made a lot of friends there that were dealing with human wildlife conflict. So that's, um, as David mentioned, my focus. So, um, we're, when we talk about conflict, we're talking about, people having their crops raided by wildlife or having their livestock eaten by wildlife or even being attacked themselves and kind of the dynamic of how people retaliate against that and the, the kind of human centered conflicts underlying all of those human wildlife conflicts. So how I first got into that is when I was studying in Kenya and Tanzania and I met people that would say things like, if a person kills a lion in retaliation for say the lion killing their cattle, then the government will be here in two days and will arrest them. Um, but if a lion kills a person, you may never see compensation or even acknowledgement of that happening. Um, so there, that kind of really broadened my view of what conservation was all about um, as this very, very interdisciplinary human-centered problem rather than just being all about wildlife, which is what I kind of grew up thinking. Um, and I had a whole new passion in life to try and understand this interdisciplinary challenge, right? This challenge that, that involves um, fields as varied as public health and economics and politics and um, you know, poverty even that, that goes into conservation and into issues like human wildlife conflict and those kinds of interdisciplinary challenges that need interdisciplinary solutions. So that's what led me to Berkeley because 
I made all of these friends in Kenya and Tanzania and they kept saying, we need tools to deal with these issues. We don't have them. And I was like, I'm extremely unqualified. I need to go somewhere where I can be in an environment to learn these tools, to understand and solve these interdisciplinary challenges. Um, and I was really interested in working with folks like Justin, who you'll hear from in a second, um, and others to, um, as you know, as Fernando touched on, to kind of take these new tools and apply them directly to the global challenges at the local scales that people needed them for. So um, I ended up in ESPUM, which is, I found out when I got here, quite widely known um, for its collaborative and applied nature. And, um, and when I say ESPIM, I mean environmental science policy and management, for those of you who don't know, my department. Um, and I am currently, well, I was in two labs um, and I really enjoy kind of the culture of being co-advised here is very accepted. Um, so I had, you know, Justin's lab, which is very um, understanding kind of how coupled human natural systems work and how those kind of interdisciplinary challenges in um, the ways that people and wildlife and people and ecology interact with one another. And also I'm in, I was in another lab with Maggie Kelly who runs the geospatial innovation facility here. Um, so I did all sorts of work with um, really understanding our, our frontier of using um, drones to kind of um, collect finer and finer scale data and be able to um, use this amazing computing power that Fernando touched on to understand these challenges at a, at a finer scale, but also at a broader scale um, using remotely sensed data, et cetera. So um, using those kind of two pillars of, of like this coupled social and um, natural systems and this kind of more data science focused um, lab that I was in, I came up with my dissertation, which is a very interdisciplinary approach to understanding human carnivore conflict and carnivore movement in developed landscapes. So I think that in uh, ESPM, I was really given an environment to, to thrive and be able to not only um, do what I was used to, which was looking at these issues from an ecological lens, but also be able to collaborate really in depth with folks who work on um, social science and using participatory methods to really elevate the voices of local communities that are dealing with these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, you know, part of my work, which I think is um, really connects well to the, the frontiers of being able to analyze large um, bodies of data that we have right now is I collected about 600 or so participatory maps from communities in the area where they would draw on these maps, these paper maps, um, their experiences with conflict with carnivores, where they feel that um, certain areas that they have to go are risky, yet they have to go there anyway to graze their livestock, and how they generally feel about where they're navigating their landscape. Um, not only so that I could kind of gather a body of data to understand carnivore conflict, but also so that people who are on the ground dealing with these issues can draw what they feel is important to them in space. So I was able to kind of feed those 600 maps into a digitization process and use um, this amazing computing power that we have here to analyze those maps and kind of elevate community voices in a, in a new way. Um, and another um, kind of amazing thing I've been able to do here at Berkeley that touches on interdisciplinary work and on data science is I was part of a program called Data Science for the 21st Century, um, which took um, graduate students from across the campus and faculty from across the campus, including David Ackerley here, um, and basically trained us in reproducible data science methods, trained us in um, all of these, these elements that um, Fernando mentioned our undergrads are, are getting like from the ground up, they're getting all of these data science methods, but you know, there's some of us that like are in this gray area where we just missed the curve, right? In, in my undergrad, we weren't learning R, we weren't learning Python, we weren't learning these things at all. And ecologists weren't expected to be data scientists, but now we are. And so data science for the 21st century was a program that kind of took all of those students that kind of just missed that curve and tried to bring us up to speed on these methods and on these tools. Um, and then, also connected us with um, part outside partners like NGOs and, and that sort of thing to, to take these tools we were learning and try to apply um, our, our lessons to different challenges that, that those partners wanted to solve. So it was, it's, it was very applied and it was very necessary because 
you know, you go into ecology, you don't expect to be a data scientist, but that's that the new world is that you, you are. Um, so I've really, I, I think that Berkeley is really trying to connect folks from all different backgrounds and all different stages of their career to this data science um, kind of frontier and, and awakening that we're having right now. So um, I, th I think I've been pretty lucky to be here. Oh, that's an extraordinary story. And I have to say, even as a faculty member, sometimes we get involved in these programs because we know we need to learn too. And the best way to learn is to just be part of a training environment because <laughs> the world is shifting. But one thing, Christine, one thing you spoke to, which is so extraordinary, is, is how human data science is, is. And Fernando as well. You know, your example of participatory mapping, ways to capture knowledge that is completely outside of realm of what we would call computational, bring it into a realm where it can be treated that way, and then bring it back into the world for decision making. And I think that speaks to a lot of what this entire community is really involved in. I, I'm also curious, Christine, if, with, in your identity as an African American woman coming into science, how has that shaped your work? And and how do you see the diversity of the perspectives of the people who are doing science, data science? climate work, conservation science, how is that diversity important to the science that we do as a community? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think I could answer you for like a full hour, um, but I'll try to keep it, keep it succinct. Um, something that I think, you know, many of us are, are aware of, but often kind of flies under the radar is that a lot of the people who are most affected by climate change and by all of these different conservation challenges are people of color and are people from underrepresented backgrounds, both, um, you know, sort of incidentally and also by design, you know, with, with things like historical um, segregation in cities and that sort of thing impacting the ecology of these different areas and, and the access of people to green spaces and um, the access of people to just, you know, basic um, socioeconomic factors that, that, they, that they have been historically been denied um, makes them more susceptible and more at risk from different issues that we're facing today around climate change and conservation. And so I think that that, that basic, keeping that um, basic little seed in mind is an important thing to consider when we're like, why is it important to have people of color and underrepresented minorities in science and doing these um, sort of projects that use data science to address conservation challenges, it's because those are the people that are most effective, right? So if the people who are, are dealing with these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis are also in the room making decisions and, and doing the science, they're gonna have a lot more effective solutions to, to these challenges. You're gonna have the right people at the table who know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work when you're designing solutions and when you're designing research projects and um, deci deciding who's gonna be involved. Um, and without that, you'll end up siloing yourself. So I think that, um, you know, programs like Data Science for the 21st Century, which was a, you know, a funded program that, you know, if you got funded, um, you know, a stipend and that sort of thing are really important to kind of bring folks like myself into data science um, and, and um, give them a, a tangible, you know, way of not just getting involved, but also like getting paid to be involved and getting like, benefits and resources to be able to actually tap into these, these um, types of science and, and um, tools that we have is really, really important. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. And I think we're going to talk more about how we're doing special faculty hires around that and that sort of thing. Um, but we have a really, really long way to go. And for me, like, for example, I, I did my PhD so that I could connect tools like this to the folks on the ground that are in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, where I've done most of my work. Um, but I would rather have been able to bring them to Berkeley themselves and like bring them to be able to just gain this knowledge and be immersed in it themselves. And, and that's kind of that divide that we need to be bridging more directly and in and, and, um, you know, devoting more resources to doing that, just so that we have those folks in the room. Thank you, Christine. And I know um, we have a no we have a long way to go at Berkeley. We also know that in many ways this is one of our core strengths, you know, compared to the landscape of other universities. But it's not something we it's not something we want to be better than everyone else at because we want everyone to be really good at, at bringing this diversity of voices to the table. So we hope we can be a leader, but we hope it's the kind of leadership that is influential both nationally and globally. And um, and it's certainly a, a value shared widely across the university, even as we tackle the challenges of of realizing those aspirations. 
So thank you for speaking to that and as and your work. Uh, and we will turn now to our final speaker, uh, Justin Brashears. Justin is the Gertz Professor in uh, a Gertz Endowed Chair in ESPM, the same department we've been speaking about, a founder of Berkeley's Biodiversity, Human Health and Livelihoods Initiative. Justin's research combines traditional ecology with interdisciplinary science to study how human activities are rapidly changing our planet and to highlight and communicate the everyday consequences of these changes for nature and society. Work in Justin's group extends traditional environmental science to consider the economic, political, and cultural factors that drive and in turn are driven by changes in biodiversity. Through these efforts, Justin is, and his group at Berkeley strive to propose empirically based action oriented strategies for global conservation. So Justin, uh, in addition to everything you're doing on campus, training students, including Christine, for example, uh, you've engaged a lot in issues of climate change and biodiversity loss as a board member for foundations, as an advisor to the National Geographic Society. So have these perspectives and your engagement with uh, what we would call external or NGOs in your work as a university professor, how they influence your approach to environmental problem solving and your view on the role that Cal can play in promoting the changes that we'd like to see. Well, thank you very much, David, and thank you all uh, for including me, and it's wonderful to see everyone. Um, but I'll try and keep my answers short so that we can save time for interaction questions. Um, but I should also, I should probably uh, have a confession, that is the first time I sort of agreed to be involved with National Geographic and some of these foundations on the East Coast. I somewhat selfishly saw it as an excuse to see my mom who's in uh, Washington, DC. A, a shout out to all the DC folks here, still living on Oliver Street in Northwest. Um, and so, uh, but what has happened over the last several years of uh, pre-COVID uh, regular trips to DC was um, a really awakening for me to, to, to see Cal um, in wonderful ways and in challenging ways through the eyes of these influential uh, media groups and um, you know, major foundations that are really actively trying to change, uh, trying to achieve positive change on our planet. And what I saw and what was so heartening was the high regard with which Cal is held and the degree to which these, this community, this management and, and uh, action community really looks to Cal for leadership in, in science. But I also, as, as Christine was just talking about and Fernando touched on eloquently and you were just saying, David, I also saw uh, or felt the perception from many of these groups um, that Cal, like many other major research universities, is sort of trapped in old structures of you know, old silos. And that um, the challenges that we face as a society and climate change is a perfect example, do not fall within any academic category, right? We're talking about, um, as Fernando said, things that transcend from the biophysical sciences to the econo to economics, to political science, and, and various aspects of sociology. And so this has really been part of my awakening and coming back to Cal and saying, how can we change what we do? How can we connect to, let's call them user groups, to the public, to, to society um, in very actionable and direct ways? And as Christine was just saying, and Fernando also touched on, you know, we do that by moving across traditional academic boundaries. And again, we don't have federal funding for this. This is getting beyond the, form, the traditional structures of federal funding. But we look to a large part to the private sector and say, help us build new forms of organization on campus. And as Ken said perfectly, it's so exciting because we have leadership in, in Chancellor Christ right now, who is um, altering how students are taught and moving again beyond boundaries and allowing us as professors and scientists and students uh, to, you know, to really think differently about what we call ourselves and how, how we engage. And Justin, one, one specific engagement you've uh, been increasingly involved in is uh, what's become known as the 30 by 30 initiative, which is the effort to conserve 30% of the, the Earth's lands and waters and the, all the biodiversity that's contained they're in uh, by 2030. And um, that's not a final goal. It's just a step on the path ahead for humanity. Uh, and you're working both in California and federally. And can you share a little bit more about uh, President Biden's priorities in that regard? Also how the role of 30 by 30 in, um, in addressing climate change, both solutions and thinking about its future impacts. Yeah, well, I love talking about 30 by 30 and I sort of, um... I uh, feel like it's something that we should, you know, uh, if, if I get on the pulpit, it's something I think we should all be paying a lot of attention to. So in short, if you're not aware, the 30 by 30 stands for is um, 
a, a, an, an, an effort to conserve 30% uh, of US lands and waters by the year 2030. And uh, President Biden signed this commitment um, as part of an executive order very early in his presidency. And I just want to give you a sense of how audacious this is. This is the greatest effort in US conservation in any of our lifetimes and in the history of our nation. And I'll, and I'll give you a sense of how grand it is. So currently 12% of the US, uh, of US lands are considered conserved. That means we need to conserve, to reach Biden's goal, we need to conserve another 18% of US land mass. That is equivalent to four times the size of California. Or put another way, if we turned every US state that touches the Atlantic Ocean, so we conserved from Florida to Maine, and we turned every one of those states into a national park, we would still not have reached the goal of 18% of the US. So of course, we're not going to do that. We're not going to displace the majority of Americans in order to create a national park. But the 30 by 30 initiative, which has billions of dollars in support and is uh, creating a huge amount of media attention and pushback in the American West and other places, but is a perfect example of both the opportunity and challenge that we face at Cal in being global leaders in an incredibly important initiative. And that is because if I gave any of you the task or all of you the task to say, okay, where do we get four Californians? Where, where do we find that? Um, you would immediately say, well, what do we have? What data are out there? What, what are we trying to conserve? Um, what are the different factors we're, we're trying to balance? What are the trade-offs in identifying those areas? And one area where we're trying to support that effort in data science is through by deploying sensor arrays. That is arrays that help us study where climate is changing quickly. We have arrays that are able to record bird song um, remotely that can, um, we have remote cameras that are able to collect photos of wildlife. And all of this, as you can imagine, is creating terabytes of data daily. And so what do we do with those amounts of data? And we, again, we're collecting those data to try and inform federal and state action. So California has passed its own 30 by 30 legislation. We're trying to integrate and assimilate these huge amounts of data into management plans, essentially, to provide advice on areas that are in greatest jeopardy of uh, are most impacted by climate change, most likely to experience biodiversity loss. But we also need models or data that can help us understand the economics of these systems from land values um, and also understand the social consequences um, for communities that are dealing with climate change. And that may be more or less tolerant to new forms of conservation. So that's just an example, David, of the ways that data science, you know, that we work across these disciplinary boundaries um, to really try and tackle a very direct and incredibly important problem, um, which is how is the US going to mitigate the impacts of climate change uh, over the next decade? Well, thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Let me, so let me pause for a moment. And if you all remember back to your days as students, you came to that moment in the class when the faculty members said, any questions? And everyone waited to see who's el who raised their hand first because it certainly wasn't gonna be you, right? Uh, unless you're one of those person people who always had your hand up first. But let me pause because I think sometimes it just takes a moment, let you digest, think. And I would just invite, you know, we invited you to use the chat, but we're a small group. Um, and you're welcome to unmute um, and, um, and and jump in with a question. I can see almost everyone, but not quite everyone. So I really would just like to invite a dialogue here. And while you're thinking about that, I will um, uh, pose a question uh, from Victoria. Maybe, I think this would be to you, Justin. Are you familiar with Douglas Tallamy's Homegrown National Park? It's a concept in the book, Nature's Best Hope. That is not one I'm familiar with. Do you know that, Justin? I'm, I'm familiar with it, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be a typical professor and pretend that I've read it or know enough about it. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, there is an incredible and important discussion going on about the role um, of, diff of new forms and different forms of protection as part of 30 by 30 that kind of move away from national parks, which if we look at them historically really have had a lot of, you know, in their creation had a lot of issues of displacement and the failure to recognize um, the communities that lived in those areas at the time. Yeah. 
So I'd love to invite any questions and comments from uh, folks who are here. Ken, go ahead. I was typing, but I'll uh, save time. <clears throat> I didn't want to be someone asking a question because the moderator should be or the convener. But um, my question is about Berkeley's special place or special opportunity here, because other leading universities have certainly embraced the need to be leaders and players in addressing climate change. And most of them do talk about their unique ability to be interdisciplinary and cross the silos, as Justin said. Um, can you give us a little more for our elevator pitch on why, why Berkeley versus some of those other universities? Because um, a, a few of us are hearing this from other very esteemed institutions. So whether we love them as much as Berkeley or not, um, well, can you help us with that one? Yeah, I'm going to turn it first to any of the panelists, and, and I have my own thoughts as well. But any of you want to share thoughts on that? Fernando? I have thoughts, but I know Fernando has good thoughts on this too, because we've had this conversation. No, you don't want to. <laughs> of course, we have this conversation all the time. Well, trying to be brief to make sure that we have other voices, but I think one, one important uh, aspect that has drawn me to Berkeley, honestly, is that it has an extremely high intellectual bar but a very broad view of what that means. And that is unusual in, a, in the world of academia, uh, right? Academia and everyone who complains about academia, and I, I do a lot of that as well, um, talks about the obsession with narrow metrics like counting papers and publication, um, salami publishing, slicing your work in the thinnest possible slice so you can sell more of it, right? Um, and, and at Berkeley, I think there's a real commitment to having an engagement with, with, the, with the rest of the world in ways that are impactful. Um, just to be obviously fairly biased and self-centered, but I don't think I could have done what I've done anywhere but Berkeley. It would have been very difficult because I came to Berkeley with a very odd background with a very unusual CV with few publications scattered all over. And what I was doing, which was building this kind of open source infrastructure 10, 15 years ago was not valued. Today it is. A few weeks ago, there was an article in Nature about this Jupiter work being one of the 10 codes that transformed science. That's today. But when I came to Berkeley, no one would give me a job. And Berkeley did. Um, and not only gave me a job, but actually supported that I build teams and communities for this kind of work. And then people at Berkeley took it and deployed it online and built these multi-thousand person courses. And now we run workshops to teach how to do that to the rest of the nation. And so there's a summer workshop on how the Berkeley infrastructure and, and teaching model can be used by other institutions. We now have a program engaging uh, community colleges and historically black institutions to provide some of this infrastructure that does take some expertise to put together and deploy and manage in the cloud so that they can have access to that. that balance of a very deep bench in science and a really strong intellectual tradition, but a, but a commitment to bringing that out to the world with a mission rather than only sort of building, I don't know, Uber for flower pots, which is what kind of some universities that are obsessed with, uh, with kind of st startups and commercialization of everything that comes across uh, get on with. Is is, uni is very special at Berkeley. I'm not saying we're the, we're the only university that cares about the world, but but it is, there's a special culture here, and I think it's it's pretty unique and and needs support. Christine, I'm tempted to ask you. I don't know how many other schools you may have applied for for grad school, but what why was Berkeley the right place? I applied to no other schools. Well, actually, <laughs> I so I, I actually did two rounds of applications, and I did apply to other schools the first round, and I got into Duke. And the reason why I chose to decline Duke and reapply to Berkeley a few years later, Justin may recall, is because of the interdisciplinarity of it and the applied nature of it. I didn't want to just do work in an academic silo. Um, and the, the work that they were doing at Duke at the time in, that, in the environmental science department was just not applied enough for me to the world's challenges. And I just would have, have rather gone to somewhere that was directly applied. And so I had this decision in front of me to decline. And so the second time that I applied, I only applied to Berkeley. I moved out here knowing I would apply to Berkeley. I worked at the Cal Academy, California Academy of Sciences for four years, and then was like, okay, it's time to reapply to Berkeley. And that's the only place I wanted to go. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> Justin. 
I'd say that's the best endorsement ever. But, um, you know, Ken, what I would say, and I know David, something you know, David has talked about in the past is um, as much as the, the sheer enormity of Berkeley makes it a very, you know, overwhelming and, and crazy and wonderful community. But this, that size is also very special and unique. And it's something that most of these other universities, I would wager all of them uh, don't have. And that is, you know, and I don't want to disparage, um, you know, my friends at other universities and the amazing things they do. But what, what we tend to find, particularly in this arena of climate and data science, is um, a lot of schools that are very good at creating a billboard and saying, look at the exciting thing we do. But if you look behind the billboard, you'll see that they have one or two people total, you know, who represent that area of research or implementation or other things. And I think the sheer size of Berkeley means that when you look behind our pitch, you're going to see, you know, 30, 40, 50 people. And of course, we're training the best students in the world, and we're training as, as many as all of the Ivies combined every year. And we're also providing that ladder out of, you know, the middle class, out of lower class, uh, more so than all of the Ivies combined and throw Stanford in there too. So here we are, this elevator to positive change, and then also this incredible breadth and depth in all, and so that allows us to sort of have it all. It, again, there are challenges with that. And you know, when David started as Dean, he had a full head of hair. So yeah, that'll show you what the challenges are like. Sorry, sorry, David. <laughs> but, uh, but so yeah, managing that ecosystem is intense, but I think it's, it's as all of you know, as, as alums, it's special um, and it's different. Yeah. Um, but we need we need to leverage it in better ways. We need to bring it together, um, and we need to bring it together around these challenges. And that's why we're here. And that's that's how I know Fernando, who's in a totally different part of campus. And that's and that's why we bring on amazing people like Christine, who say, "I don't want a PhD in a discipline. I want a PhD in the future." Oh, thank you all. I can uh, all I will add is that I have never felt more inspired to do my own, to do my job, to come to work every day, that the depth of it, but it just is, it's meaningful work being at Berkeley in a way, and I've been through privates and other parts of my career and it never felt the same. Um, but we're also blessed in the United States to have such extraordinary range of universities because none of us would want to, none of us would want to be doing this alone. If we didn't have our peers around the country and around the world, we wouldn't succeed because this is the key to the role that universities play is the amazing partnerships. I, I want to turn to a, um, I want to turn to an energy question from Sandeep and, and Fernando, you might have some thoughts about the actual energy demands of the technologies themselves. So do you see things around in your community, Berkeley, about how, uh, sorry, Fernando, about how Berkeley is addressing the problem that the data science is itself an energy dra drain and we're trying to tackle climate change? <laughs> it is. Well, one of the things we have to do is actually keep the Bitcoin miners away. Uh, and that's a very real problem in that for example, these tools that I, I that I showed you uh, that are cloud hosted, we host a version of these that anyone can use to share their work. And it's effectively for free computers in the cloud so that you can show someone your work in a way that they can reproduce and reuse immediately without installing anything. That is a huge enabler of informed conversations around data, around computation. It makes the scientific discourse better. But because we're literally putting free computers on the internet, the Bitcoin miners are all over it. And it's it's a terrible situation. Uh, there is just no redeeming uh, redeeming uh, aspects to, to that. That, to that practice. But um, at Berkeley, I think one of the things that perhaps not everyone here is, has fully in their, in their perhaps radar is that we also have this amazing partnership with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is right up the hill from campus. It's literally our fences are the boundary. Um, it is managed by UC Berkeley, but it is a natural, national federal facility that belongs to the Department of Energy. And their focus is energy. It is the Department of Energy. And so not only do we have researchers on campus who are very active in studying energy efficiency in a variety of ways. We also have this kind of deep, deep bench of energy science that we connect with. Many of us have joint affiliations and joint appointments. We do projects with LBL. Um, and, uh, and I think that gives us resources to ask these questions uh, that, are, that are hard to find elsewhere. LBL is a pretty, is a pretty unique, unique resource. Um, I do think that building tools of this nature that allow us, that allow us to work 
collaboratively um, and do things once and then share that work without everyone ha having to replicate it may be helpful, but I'm not naive enough to pretend that the things we do are, because we do them with good intentions are magically good. Uh, we, we do need to remain critical even of the things we build because the things we build can be misused and, or, can be, or can have unintended side effects. And I very much appreciate that we have also new faculty on campus whose focus is, for example, on the ethical implications of computing, right? And in a variety of ways, not just energy, but in a variety of ways, uh, we take that seriously and we have colleagues who have that expertise that we can tap into. Yeah, and then uh, thank you, Fernando. And, you know, and and sometimes our influence is a little out of sight. If you you know if you dig in the, if you dig around, you can see it. But we had um, one of our faculty who took a leave of absence and helped build Amazon's sustainability plan, and that's leading to their commitment to a zero carbon fleet. And then their data centers are, of course. So I think all who are concerned about climate and in computing and data science are keenly aware of the issues of the data centers and. That's why they, some of them sitting out in the desert so you can put them on solar power. Uh, I have to echo Bitcoin now I just feel is this terrible thing. I hope no one takes offense to that if you're an investor or something. But if, if you haven't read about the energy demands of Bitcoin, have a look because there is that, that, that one's particularly frustrating as a, as a use of energy without an obvious social benefit, frankly. But that's another discussion. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really, you know, just to go to the campus, we are actually engaged in rebuilding our energy system. Our cogen plant is about to go out of it's, it's ending, reaching the end of its useful life. We may be building, we may be trying to invest in cutting edge heat pump technology at an industrial scale that could provide heat and power to entire quadrants of campus from, um, so over the, these are massive investments and partly is to position Berkeley as a leader uh, in, um, as a university leader in terms of how we apply new technologies and use them on our on our campus. Uh, so all of these are things that are underway. Um, I, 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 not to make that point too strongly, but this was in the news this week about literally revi reviving a, a dead power plant only to mine Bitcoin, yeah. literally turning, turning on a coal plant to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah so. that was but for what it's worth, you can no longer buy your Tesla with Bitcoin. There was one nice announcement in, in, in the news this week that hopefully others will start paying attention to and thinking about the role it plays. Well, that, that took us on a bit of a tangent. Um, I know we're running out of time, um, and I'm, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take the moderator's privilege. Is there anyone who wants to jump in on, on unmute and toss a final quick question to the panel? Hi hey everyone, um, I might try. Um, I guess I wonder what all of you think is your favorite project um, at the intersection of data science and um, the uh, environmental equity. What's gonna happen? What, what should we be hopeful for? What are we looking at Berkeley doing that will change the world and make it more equitable? One sentence each to answer that. <laughs> Fernando, anything to add on top of your work with the Canadian communities, which is fascinating? No, and I, and I want to say that this is, that connection is very indirect. I know them and they are, but they have, they have led on that. Uh, however, that has, that has led to what currently is, in a sense, my, probably one of my favorite projects, which is that together with the folks who were behind some of that, um, some of that work, we've, we've created a new, literally a new organization, this this organization called 2i2c, which is to build and deploy this kind of open infrastructure, but bring it to the communities, right? Bring it to colleges, bring it to universities, uh, but it's a nonprofit entity. It's actually housed under the Berkeley kind of fiscal umbrella, uh, but uh, because as a university, we shouldn't be running a business. We're not Amazon. Right, but at the same time, we don't want to leave this kind of work strictly to commercial interests. And so, together with folks from Berkeley and from the Canadian team who put some of that together, we've created a new nonprofit entity to precisely try to tackle kind of this this area, this gray zone, which is neither a for-profit business, not purely academic research. And we're trying to build this with funding from the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative right now into an entity that hopefully will have important impact. It's not specific to environmental research, but right. for example, right now, our pilot projects are with, with uh, historically black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions. Right. Christine, uh, one, one additional point to add from... Sure, yeah, uh, I think I have a lot of things to say, but along with the, the very targeted effort right now to bring in diverse faculty and get people in those positions of power that, that maybe should be there, um, something that I didn't mention is a lot of our um, 
like a lot of the major citizen science and um, participatory mapping kind of efforts and apps have come out of Berkeley. Um, so things like iNaturalist were created by Berkeley people and um, Local Ground, which is a participatory mapping effort. Um, uh, and basically putting the, the data curation in the hands of, of folks who ha historically have not been able to, to create and curate the data is uh, an amazing thing that just percolates up from Berkeley. And I think it's really, really great to be connected to it here. And I'm just, um, yeah, Justin, final edition. It's yeah, tough to do a sense, but I just say along with a lot of the science, I think one of the most satisfying things is working with foundations to connect, um, you know, very rural indigenous groups across the Americas and Africa to foundations to support the, these groups in deploying their own biodiversity sensor arrays and where they have full control end to end of how, how they deploy it and the information they want and how they want to engage their own citizens. And so it's, I feel really a way of empowering and actually giving these folks the voice of data, which is a, of course, a language that is um, universally respected. Um, so that's, that's been super satisfying. Yeah, it, just to wrap up, I think one thing you're all hearing is one of the one of the traps of academia has been who, this question, who are we doing research for? How do we get the research to a community? And what you're really hearing is it's who are we doing research with? And how are we co-creating the questions and the process together? And I think, unfortunately, it's a lesson that's been learned the hard way many times that unless it starts at the early in the process of that co-creation, the products are not truly going to be you know, embraced and useful. And I think that's something that is embraced very widely as part of that core ethos of what makes Berkeley a special place. We've run over a couple of minutes and Ken, I should give you the last word, <clears throat> excuse me, the last word and thank you for hosting us. I have two words, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being here and I wanna thank the panel again. What a pleasure to see you all and we look forward to seeing more of you in person. <laughs> thank you, nice to see everyone, goodbye. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much and bye. Thank you, Ken. Look forward to seeing you again soon, all of you. Very soon, yep. <laughs>